I'm sure everyone out there watching this video has at some point watched a movie and just wanted to scream in frustration at the screen when a character doesn't do the obvious thing and just get the hell out of there and save their own skin. It is maddening to watch a character fail to demonstrate even the most basic sense of self-preservation, but every so often screenwriters are canny enough to appreciate how much this irritates us viewers and in turn decides to flip the script instead. With that in mind, I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com and these are 10 movie characters who actually knew when to quit. Number 10, Flower Child, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. In Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Quentin Tarantino's deliciously revisionist take on the Tate LaBianca murders, Mayor Hawk plays a member of the Manson family named Flower Child. She is based on actual Manson family mender Linda Kasabian, who didn't directly participate in the murders and ultimately testified against those who did, in turn receiving immunity from prosecution. And in the movie's third act, when the family have an altercation with Rick Dalton and decide to kill him instead of Sharon Tate, Flower Child makes the very wise decision to just nope out of the whole situation. She tells fellow family member Tex that she left her knife in their car, and when Tex throws her the keys to unlock it, she decides to just straight up drive off, leaving the three remaining assailants without transportation. Not that it matters in the end though, given that they're all brutally murdered by Rick and Cliff Booth in the moments that follow, so Flower Child herself was smart enough to follow her gut on this one. Number 9, Kingo, Eternals. At the start of Eternals' fraught third act, the heroes learn that one of their own, Icarus, willingly led their former leader Ajax to her death when she attempted to stop the imminent birth of the Celestial Tiamat, which would in turn cause Earth's destruction. Icarus promises that he'll kill every single one of his fellow Eternals if they try to stop Tiamat's birth, and though most of the heroes ultimately decide to stand up and fight back against him, there is one notable exception. After Icarus departs, Kingo tells the rest of the group that he thinks that Icarus is right, but that he also refuses to hurt any of his friends for his beliefs, and so takes his leave. While many viewers understandably expected the character to return in the final battle and help the Eternals fend off Icarus, it surprisingly never happens, with Kingo sticking to his word and staying out of the fight. Number 8, Sven, the Running Man. In the classic Arnold Schwarzenegger action vehicle The Running Man, the villainous host of the deadly titular game Damon Killian has a hefty bodyguard Sven to do his bidding. In the third act, when contestant Ben Richards starts winning over the audience, Killian throws a fit in the control room and takes it out on Sven, making a crack about steroids turning him deaf. This put down actually comes back to bite the villain in the ass in the most ultimate way at the very end of the film though. When Richards manages to fight his way to Killian for the final confrontation. At this point, Killian motions to Sven, believing that Sven will step in and save him, but Sven has other ideas, hilariously telling his boss, I've gotta score some steroids, before giving Richards a knowing look and promptly walking off. Number 7, Agents Brown and Jones, The Matrix. Though Agent Smith is of course the Matrix's ultimate antagonist, he works alongside two other agents who regularly appear throughout the first film, those of course being Agent Brown and Agent Jones. Yet despite being sentient programs with a single-minded commitment to destroying Neo, even they have enough self-preservation instinct to know when they're fighting a losing battle. After Neo flies inside Agent Smith and obliterates him inside out, Neo turns his attention to the two remaining agents who promptly stare at each other and, without saying anything, both run off in opposite directions. They're never seen again in the movie, nor have they reappeared in any of the three sequels, and though it is possible that they were deleted and replaced by the new agent programs encountered in those sequels, it's also possible that they just refused to be deleted and became exile programs instead. No matter what eventually happens to them though, they knew they were in the presence of greatness when they saw what Neo did to Smith, and thought better of sticking around to fight him. Number 6, Dr. Silberman, Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. One of the Terminator series' most memorable supporting characters is Dr. Peter Silberman, a criminal psychologist who expresses intense skepticism over Kyle Reese and especially Sarah Connor's Tales of the Future in the first two movies. 
In one of the third film's funniest moments, he makes a brief cameo appearance in the middle of an action sequence set at a mausoleum, where John Connor, Kate Brewster and the T-800 stop to pick up weapons and supplies. During the fight, the cops secure Kate, who technically was a hostage of John and the Terminator, and take her to an ambulance where she's greeted by Dr. Silberman. He introduces himself as a post-trauma counsellor, and when Kate insists that the T-800 isn't human, Silberman patronisingly assures her that she's just imagining things, while noting that he himself was in a similar situation in the two prior films. And just at that moment, the T-800 emerges out of the mausoleum with a giant cachet of weapons, causing a stunned Silberman to immediately hightail it. Granted, the T-800 wouldn't have actually caused him any harm in this instance, but given his prior traumatic experiences being around Terminators, he at least knew it was time to get the hell out of Dodge. Number 5. The Malfoys – Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 at the end of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, once Voldemort has seemingly killed Harry with the Killing Curse, he implores all of those assembled at Hogwarts to surrender to him. At this point, Lucius and Narcissa Malfoy call their son Draco to join their side with Voldemort, and after some brief consideration, he reluctantly complies. This unison ends up being short-lived though, as once Harry reveals himself to in fact be alive and starts summarily kicking Voldemort's ass, the Malfoys all decide that they probably shouldn't stick around to see who wins, and are promptly seen leaving the area to parts unknown. It's of course entirely in character with these self-serving Malfoys to act this way, to bet on a horse and then abandon it the second the chips are down. Number 4. Olivia Wenscombe, The Prestige One of the most prominent supporting characters in Christopher Nolan's The Prestige is Olivia Wenscombe who starts out as Robert Angie's assistant, but while spying on his rival, Alfred Borden, falls in love with Borden and becomes his assistant instead. But after Borden's wife, Sarah, commits suicide amidst his schizophrenic personality traits due to him pulling a double act with his twin brother, Olivia decides that she's had enough of Borden and Angie's increasingly costly, dangerous feud and straight up pieces out of the situation altogether. At lunch with Borden, she brushes off his attempts to explain his own paradoxical behaviour and tells him that Angie has been working on a nifty new magic trick and then coolly suggests that the pair deserve each other through their single-minded desperation to outdo one another. Given the grim ultimate outcome of Borden and Angie's feud, she was certainly smart to wash her hands of it before things got truly ugly. Number 3. The Aim Guard – Iron Man 3 Iron Man 3 may be one of the Marvel Cinematic Universe's more divisive offerings to date, but it did give the world perhaps the single smartest henchman in the history of the franchise. While escaping villain Aldrich Killian's compound at the start of the third act, Tony Stark cleans house of Killian's assembled AIM goons. Yet before he can unload on one of them, the guy, played by regular MCU stuntman Steve Orem, drops his gun, puts his hands in the air, and hilariously tells Stark, Honestly, I hate working here, they are so weird. At this point, Stark motions for the guard to go on his merry way, and he wastes no time at all in scapering the hell out of there. It's perhaps the most purely Shane Black line of dialogue in the entire film, and provides a welcome burst of expectation-defying comic relief in the middle of a typical superhero movie action sequence. Number 2. Psylocke – X-Men Apocalypse X-Men Apocalypse may be an aggressively mediocre entry into this franchise, and many fans weren't at all impressed with Olivia Munn's so-so performance as mutant superhero Psylocke, but her character was at least written to be uncommonly smart for the genre. See, Psylocke is recruited by the supervillain Apocalypse to join his side as one of his four horsemen. But when she witnesses Apocalypse's climactic defeat at the hands of the X-Men, she knows better than to dare challenge them. After Jean Grey obliterates her leader using the Phoenix Force, we catch a brief glimpse of Psylocke watching this unfold and, rather than fighting in his stead or changing sides and joining the X-Men, she promptly flees into the night instead. Given that Psylocke never reappeared in any subsequent X-Men movie, we're left to assume that she basically vanished off the radar forevermore. Number 1. Blofeld's Cat – For Your Eyes Only 
Now this one might sound silly at first, but when you consider that one of the most distinctive aspects of Ultimate Bond Baddie Blofeld is his white cat, then it does make a little bit more sense, I promise. For Your Eyes Only opens with a ridiculously wacky pre-title sequence, in which 007, Roger Moore this time, disposes of a villain bearing a strong resemblance to Blofeld. Yet due to rights issues surrounding the character at the time, he could not be named or identified as such in the movie. The scene ends with Bond scooping up, totally not Blofeld's wheelchair, with a helicopter and then dropping him down a chimney, killing him dead. But not before his cat sees the writing on the wall and thinks better of it. Seconds before Bond swoops in, we see Blofeld's cat meow loudly and then leap off its owner's lap, in turn sparing itself the same brutal and hilarious fate. So that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below about these moments. Are there any interesting ones you think we should have included? And do you think you would have acted as smart as these characters if you were in these situations? Let us know and while you're down there, could you please give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't though, I've been Josh. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.